Okay, uh, good, good morning everybody and congratulations for being here at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning because it certainly is a, a, a measure of commitment. Um, my name is Owen Reedy from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. Delighted to be here this morning with Sean Byers from Trademark who I will introduce in a moment. Um, obviously it's day four of uh, the, the, the International ILSH uh, uh, Festival and debate and discussion and um, I think we've had a really good few days. Uh, I think it's important session this morning, it's a good one to start on because the labour movement, the trade union movement has had a lot of debate and discussion and varying views about the whole idea of, of social Europe. Um, I want to thank our sponsors, Dublin City Council and also the Department of Tourism, Sport, Media and Culture. Uh, I was wondering about the order of that. Uh, Sean uh, Byers is our speaker, Sean's going to speak for about 20-25 minutes, there'll be five minutes for uh, a brief Q&A after and then we'll move on to the, the next session. Uh, Sean comes from Trademark, uh, which is an organisation based in Belfast, uh, right on, on the peace line as such, uh, and has a long tradition in working with trade unions in Ireland and in Britain on political economy, on progressive uh, left-wing uh, causes and uh, building capacity against things like anti-racism. Uh, and, and very important issues like that for civil society. Sean's responsible for uh, the research uh, work in Trademark and I think he's worked there uh, for nearly a decade now and he's done some work with us in the Congress and I know they work closely with the TUC. So if you could uh, give Sean a warm welcome and Sean, the floor is yours, thanks. Okay, well thanks a lot for the very generous introduction. Well, uh, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak at this event. Uh, as a historian by trade, it feels a little strange to be asked here to speak about the future. Um, but it's, it's to the great credit of the Irish Labour History Society that it's decided with this program of events to cover such a broad range of contemporary subjects to try to locate the position of, of the Irish Labour community with within the 21st century and to embrace and the challenges, the multiple challenges facing us today. Uh, I've probably prepared too much for my allotted 20 minutes, which is not what a chair wants to hear. But, and, I'll, and so I'll cut my cloth accordingly, but I thought it'd be useful to begin by reminding ourselves how social Europe was originally understood by the political left and the institutions of organized labor across the continent. In the first place, it should be remembered that social democracy in the post-war Europe was largely, if not entirely, defined by a left-wing tendency that saw the gradual advancement of socialism leading to a, an eventual rupture with the capitalist system. Now, in retrospect, we can debate the tactical, tactical context and whether the approach pursued was more likely to establish the basis for ending capitalism or for its continued reproduction. And those debates have taken place so, over the years. But the point remains that much of Western Europe at this time maintained a commitment to a broadly socialist position in the two decades following the Second World War. And nor was this limited to the left's most radical elements. Throughout the period, the questions of workplace democracy, economic planning, and the socialization of production were extensively discussed in all parties and trade union bodies. As has been noted by the historian Jeff Ely, these questions lay at the heart of social democracy's historic mission to make the democratic social and thereby prefigure the building of a socialist society. Of course, this thinking developed against the backdrop of ongoing European integration, whereas support for economic and political federation was strongest amongst the six founder members of the European coal and steel community, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Holland, Luxembourg, the political left and the trade union movement outside of the core tended to be more critical on socialist grounds. This extended to Ireland where, as you well know, in, in 1972, a special delegate conference of the ICTU voted to oppose EEC membership out of concern for its impacts on employment and living standards, the failure to recognize Ireland's unique industrial and regional development needs, the loss of political and economic sovereignty and the potential involvement of the Irish state in European military commitments. Now, as prescient as this assessment may have been, 
It was nonetheless short-lived as the trade union movement set about coming to terms with the practical considerations of EEC membership. And the story of how this came about features in a really interesting collection of essays that was published by the ICTU to, to mark the 50th anniversary of Ireland's accession to the EEC. Now, ICTU was not alone in adapting to the reality of European integration and the institutional architecture created by it. Successive trade unions and left parties followed the same path over the course of the 1970s as they became progressively engaged with EEC bodies and with pan-European political debate. This process is detailed by the historian Aureli Andre in her excellent new, I'm sure I've mispronounced that, in, the excellent, in her excellent new book on social Europe, which provides a new perspective on the left's approach to European integration in that key period. Andre shows that the, as the left parties and trade unions of Western Europe reached the peak of their powers during the economic crisis of the mid 70s, there were serious attempts to discuss and envision a social or socialist alternative to the neoliberal model of uh, European integration that would ultimately prevail. During this time, some progress was made in the lead up to the first European Parliament elections to develop a common program of public investment, industrial policy, full employment, shorter working hours, European level collective bargaining provisions and progressive fiscal policy, alongside a commitment to peace and meaningful cooperation with development countries. And that included a redistribution of wealth and power. Although this program fell short of advocating strongly for democratic ownership of production or finance, or addressing the question of uh, capitalism's long-term future, it at least promised to grapple with key aspects of the crisis while leaving the door open to future advances towards a new economic order. In the event, even this program was watered down and reduced to a dead letter before being jettisoned entirely as the leading socialist parties of the European core gradually abandoned the more radical positions they had occupied just a few years earlier. The road not taken, referred to in the subtitle of Andre's book, captures the failure of European socialists to formulate, cohere, and advance a real alternative at a critical juncture in history. Underlying this failure were the roads not taken in different national contexts at different times, from the alternative economic strategy of the British Labour Party left to the 101 propositions of Mitterrand's French Socialist Party. And from an Irish perspective, Brenton Corish's A New Republic might also be included in the long list of left-wing political projects that were either underdeveloped or defeated during this time. Now, what followed requires little explanation as is well known, the advent of neoliberalism marked the creation of a new regime of capitalist development, one that fundamentally restructured the global economy while further eroding the balance of power between labor and capital. As trade unions came under attack and began to suffer rapid decline in membership and density, many looked for solace in the servicing model or in the social pact for their part, having reconciled themselves with the preservation of, of capitalism, the socialist and social democratic so parties of Europe went stop one step further in embracing the new neoliberal orthodoxy. And this embrace was consummated with what we know as the end of history, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the emergence of modernizing third way projects, which made a clear break with the past. In turn, the key architecture and provisions of the European Union as we know it were constructed at a time when neoliberalism was in its ascendancy, particularly in the European core. I need not remind anyone here of Thatcher's pivotal role in the creation of the single European market, which unified and deregulated markets while binding member states to pursue more business-friendly policies in a race to the bottom. And likewise, although Delors may have seen monetary union as a mechanism for strengthening European integration on a social basis. The dominant ideological influence shaping the EMU from its creation was the approach of sound money and fiscal discipline advocated by Thatcher's economists and those of the German Bundesbank. The 1992 Maastricht Treaty, in which the single European market and the euro are embedded, 
thus eliminated many of the remaining restrictions on the four freedoms, the free flow of goods, for services, labour labor and capital, while weakening the capacity of member states to chart their own path. Neoliberal integration reached its zenith in 2009 with the ramming through of the Lisbon Treaty, which extended the rules of competition in the key areas of the public sector and provided the EU's unelected bodies, particularly the European Commission and the European Council, with expanded powers in proposal, negotiation and decision making over the heads of national parliaments. The fiscal, finally, the fiscal compact and the associated reforms introduced, introduced in the wake of the financial crisis cut even more deeply into the fiscal autonomy of member states and restrict, restricted the room for discretionary action by, by national parliaments. And, and what, what have been the, the consequences of, of this neoliberal integration? I'm very conscious of the time, so I'll just run quickly through what I see as the four main structural challenges and areas of concern. First, the constitutionalization of a particular view of how the economy should be organized, one that privileges the rights of capital over labor and contains enforcement mechanisms with this in the effect. And this is underpinned by the primacy of EU law over national law, locking in Market, market liberalization and austerity and making it difficult, I wouldn't say possible, making it difficult for member states and especially the weaker states to move in the opposite direction. Two, and relatedly, over the past 20 years, policy making and decision making within the EU has become more of a technocratic, elite driven process insulated from de democratic deliberation. During this time, the European Commission and European Council have become the two prime movers of integration. Uh, and legal scholars have argued that in this increasing concentra concentration of power in the hands of the EU executive has strengthened horizontal ties between national elites while hollowing out democracy and insulating policies from popular pressure from below. Another layer to this, of course, is the army of 30,000, I think it is, lobbyists stationed in Brussels, an estimated 90% of which hail from the co corporate sector and enjoy unrivaled access to the European Commission. Three, the EU clearly doesn't function on the basis of equality between member states, but in the form of a core periphery relationship that has emerged over the last 30 years. Germany in this is the hegemon and has benefited most from the policies of EU integration, or rather its industrialists and financiers have. By contrast, the European experience, the experience of southern, the southern European periphery, excuse me, has been one of structural economic decline, debt servitude. The integration of Eastern Europe has followed the low road of economic development characterized by low wages, low taxes, and uh, deregulation. Ireland in this system occupies a strange position, uh, consistently al allying itself with the core despite, despite being on the receiving end of the Troika's austerity program. Fourthly, and finally, there's the role of the EU as a global actor. Many have referred, many scholars have referred to this as the emergence of a new empire. Um, and those who make this claim will point to the system of unequal exchange and trade that's maintained between the EU and the Global South through dozens of bilateral trade deals, to the role of the common agricultural policy in destroying the livelihoods of farmers in the Global South and Africa in particular under the concerted attempt by the European Commission to construct this notion of European values, which is often manifested in the violence of fortress Europe. And all of this undercuts the commitment to internationalism that lies at the heart of our labor movement. At an EU-wide level, the social, economic and political effects of neoliberal integration have been far reaching. These include the corresponding trends of uneven financialization and deindustrialization, including the loss of millions of unionized jobs, the flatlining of public investment, 
the hollowing out of public services and state capacity through austerity and large-scale privatization, poor economic performance, particularly since the 2010s, reflected in low and declining rates of GDP, the attendant decline of trade union density and labor share of national income across the block, and growing divergence between the core and periphery, as I've, as I've noted. In short, the conditions prevailing within the actually existing European Union are far removed from the original vision of social Europe. Now, as, as a number of scholars have argued, the period since the 2008 crisis represents a historical interregnum in the Gramscian sense that the old order is dying, but the new one cannot be born. While changes to the European and glo global economy were already well in the making, these have been accelerated by the impact of the crash, the onset of the pandemic, the runaway climate crisis, and the challenge the US economy posed by China and other emerging powers. With neoliberal financialization across the advanced capitalist world showing signs of weakness, uh, core economies have come to depend heavily on the state. In both Europe and the US, US this has led some commentators to speak, uh, and prematurely I would argue, of a progressive paradigm shift in our political economy. Now what replaces neoliberal, neoliberalism remains uh, an open question. Excuse me. Despite more than a, a decade of social, economic and political upheaval, wealth and power are more concentrated than ever. Authoritarianism is on the rise within and outside of the EU's borders, accompanied by the continued march of the far right into the political mainstream. Geopolitical conflict, militarization pose a grave risk to humanity up to including the prospect of nuclear war. The political left and the trade union movements are in a more weakened state and up until now have lacked a compelling narrative for radical social, economic and political change. And, and yet, this historical moment is ripe with opportunities. For example, the turn to large scale in, state, inter, state intervention and industrial policy moves us closer to the possibility of a just transition to zero carbon economy managed by the state. Alongside this, the suspension of EU fiscal rules and the ECB's buy-in of public debt in huge volumes during the pandemic have dis largely discredited the narrative of austerity, raising questions as, as to how or whether the pre-existing order can be reimposed. Added to this is the strike wave that has gripped Europe in the past year which has bolstered the membership and the confidence of organized labor. And it is due to the relative resilience of the trade union movement, particularly in comparison to its counterpart in, in the US, that many of the rights and protections won over the years remain in place. And they're soon to be strengthened by enhanced collective bargaining provisions. So social Europe may, may not have survived in a systemic sense, but it endures within the, the structures of the trade union movement including the TUC, and then the persistent demands of workers and citizens for a decent standard of living. Uh, in some ways, the, the answers to the challenges facing us are no different to those presented by the European left and trade union movement over the past 50 years. Major public investment to restore public services and boost employment. I'm very close to finishing. The, the provision, uh, the strengthening of workers' rights, the redistribution of wealth within and bet between countries, debt restructuring and, and cancellation. These are all demands that we have made over the last few decades. But we're also operating in a very different context in which the property rights of, of the 1% will need to be challenged. Democratic ownership advanced and the ecocidal logic of capitalist growth unwound for the preservation of the planet and humanity. Uh, the project of, of constructing a social or socialist Europe will also need to be a project of dem democratization, a project of peace, and of real international 
solidarity, particularly with the global south. Now, how this is to be achieved is a is a matter for for us all and won't be resolved today. But I think the basis and the imperative for this exists, uh, and the basis and imperative exists for the labour movement to play a leading role. So I'll maybe leave it there, Owen. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Sean, um, for a, a very comprehensive, and I appreciate you were, you were up against the time, but I think you managed it really well. A uh, really comprehensive, interesting uh, overview as to how we've got here, and uh, unlike, unlike some contributors, sometimes you, you, you've signaled what you consider to be maybe the way forward and a few opportunities that are there. So what I'm going to do is open it up to uh, some commentary, some questions, because obviously you know, this is an issue that there are many views within the within the, the, the trade union movement on. So what we might do is take one or two comments or questions together, and I'm gonna try and see them with the lights, and there might be a roving mic. I see Seamus Dooley, and we take maybe one or two, or maybe even three, and then Sean can respond. So Seamus, there's a mic. Seamus Dooley, and then you, Jay. Uh, just on, on your, your analysis there, there's some parts that I would agree with, and some that I wouldn't, but I'm going to throw the curveball at you. If the, lo the logic of what you're saying is that the problem is Europe, uh, and I, you identify many of them, how do you deal with the issue of Brexit and the consequence of Brexit? That, hasn't, that poses the great existential threat to workers in the UK at the moment. So when you talk about, like, the reality is the, the arguments you have made, some of that could be, would be adopted by those who were in favour of Brexit, but as the Secretary, or the Assistant General Secretary of a union representing workers in the UK, and just having come back from the TUC, I'm very well aware of the fears of workers from, uh, as a result of the dismantling of the achievements uh, under the EU. So how do you square that circle? Okay, thanks Seamus. We might take another one if, if, if there's anyone offering. Just pop up your hand. Okay, we've we two down here, the, the gentleman in the grey jacket and then the, the, the guy behind him, and then we'll ha uh, hand back to Sean, thanks. Yeah, Might just is, say who you are. Yeah, my name is Finn Ganey, I'm the president of the Dublin Council of Trade Unions. I want to ask a question about the rise of the right in Europe and how the European Union institutions should deal with it. In particular, France, who were faced for the third time with the possibility of a right-wing victory. The rise of the right in Britain, as expressed through UKIP and the Brexit victory. And then you have countries such as Hungary and Poland with the right wing controlled institutions of state. So I'm interested to hear your ideas on how the European institutions can take on the rise of the right, which is the real danger facing workers across all European countries and in the world at large, actually. But principally, the question is directed at the attitude towards the rise of the right in the countries of Europe. I didn't mention Germany. That's not an example of the right gaining a foothold in the country. Sure, well, thanks for that. And I think the guy behind you there. Um, well, uh, sorry, Oshino Driscoll. My question was actually fundamentally the same as the other speakers. I might just add that I think that something to think about with the far right and the rise of the extreme right in Europe is that a lot of these parties present themselves as offering some kind of challenge to the neoliberal consensus that you've highlighted. But once in power, it seems to me that they'll run into the same structural issues that you were talking about, like the constitutionalization of these economic policies. And so it, 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 I think it raises interesting questions about where, what, what they will actually do in power and what happens after, let's say, a far-right project fails in that sense. But, uh, but yeah, fundamentally, it was the same as the other speakers. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks very much. So the two general areas there, Brexit, I suppose, and the fallout of it, and uh, I think not, inter not, not, not linked uh, the rise of the far right and populism. I think, personally, I would say, Brexit and far right populism has has a strand that it, that has something in common. That's just a personal view. Over to you, Sean. Yeah. So I'll take the Brexit uh, one first. I suppose the Brexit experience shows that, uh, as messy as it was to get into the European Union, it's even messier to 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 exit without a clear uh, and coherent left-wing strategy um, and I think that was you know it, there was a, a right-wing exit from the European Union was never inevitable but at the same time the 
Lexit arguments presented never came close. But they never, you know, popularized or mainstream. The Corbyn uh, moment, I don't think, ever came close to to state power. Um, and so that that was a reflection of the national conditions. Um, it wasn't an essential element of exit in the European Union, but it came down to the balance of power within Britain at the time. Um, and that, you know, the, and, and I think the, my, my, I don't believe that the European Union can be reformed in a progressive institution, but in terms of strategy, I don't believe it can be reformed in a progressive institution, but I, I don't preclude the possibility of it being reformed in a more progressive direction. And that raises questions for, in terms of strategy for uh, left-wing parties, um, learning from the experience of Brexit, learning from the, the uh, experience of the Syriza government when they come, in, come into contact with uh, the power of capital at the centre of, center of Europe. And so the proposition uh, that the European Union can or can't be reformed just has to be tested by national governments and by national governments working, working together. Um, there was an interesting experience a few, a few years back where the left parties, certain left parties of Europe concentrated in the southern periphery but not exclusively came together and they formed a coalition called Plan B. And their argument was basically, we don't believe, just what I've said, we don't believe the European Union can be reformed, can become a, a social or socialist institution, but we're going to test that in practice. We're going to test it by breaking the rules um, with public spending commitments, we're going to test it by breaking the rules by uh, supporting workers, supporting families and communities. And that would be a, an educational experience in, in, in itself. Uh, so it, I think the, the, the proposition, of, as I said, the proposition of whether whether an exit can be progressive or not, has to, or membership of the European Union can be progressive or not, has to be tested on a case-by-case -case basis. In terms of the rise of the far right, yeah, the, one, of the success, the, one of the successes of the far right, we've done a lot of work on this over, over the years, and as you said, like one of the successes stories of the far right is that they've managed to present what sound like coherent anti-systemic alternatives, um, and particularly at a time when, rightly or wrongly, the left and the trade union movement of, of Europe has been perceived to be upholders of the status quo. Now, when the far right get into government, it's business as usual. They don't implement anti-systemic policies, they don't implement radical policies, and, and various far right projects have been found out over, over the years once they've got into power, once they've got in, get into government. Um, I'm not sure what the European ins institutions can do um, to tackle the rise of the far right. I think the, the, the neoliberal, the constitutionalized neoliberal order that I've, they've spoken of um, and the consensus that, that there is no alternative um, has, uh, along with the, the anti-democratic trends within the EU, have created, at least partly created, the basis for the far right to emerge. So I'm not sure what the European institutions can do. I'm not sure if it's their job to tackle the rise of the far right or whether they're equipped to do it. I think that's the job of the European left and the European trade union movements. Um, and I'm, like, I'm, I'm glad to say that, that, that they have uh, begun to, to come together to develop a strategy for tackling the far right. Um, we have done some work with the TUC on, on this question in terms of the, the development political education, in terms of looking to tackle uh, the rise of far right organizing and attitudes in the workplaces, in terms of information sharing between trade union confederations, uh, exchanging knowledge and, and best practice, and in terms of trying to develop uh, a coherent uh, and compelling narrative of what a different future would, would look like. 
So I, I think, as I said, I, there is a basis for a, a, a social Europe and the, the efforts of the European trade union movement and tackling the far right are, are part of that. Thanks very much uh, for that, Sean. We're going to just have to wrap up in a, in a moment. I'm just going to abuse the privilege of chair just to make one comment. I mean, it, I think, uh, let's go back to Seamus Dooley's point about Brexit. One abiding real serious regret I have is that in, in the last 12 to 14 months, the trade union movement across the European Union, led by the ETC, managed to achieve the adequate minimum wages directive, which if it's transposed properly in this jurisdiction, has the potential to radically transform our collective bargaining framework like never before. Now, the real challenge, obviously, is to try and uh, transpose it progressively with a centre-right government who are going to be hostile to it. Um, it could change uh, collective bargaining coverage, the right to access in the workplace, potentially the right to organise. And again, this wasn't handed to us from Europe. It was fought very hard by progressives and trade unionists and those of us on the, on the, on the, on the left across Europe and ETC. And I'm delighted that Esther's here. She played a particularly lead role uh, in the issue. Uh, but the abiding tragedy is it won't apply to our members in Northern Ireland because they've been dragged out of the European Union, I would say, uh, against their will. Uh, but anyway, um, I, think, I think the debate is interesting. There are different perspectives. There always have been uh, and there always will be. But the one thing I'm sure we're all united on is that there's an obligation of all of us in the labour and trade union movement right across the European Union to not give an inch to the populist far right um, it's really, really frustrating and sad to see centre-right parties uh, taking their clothes and, and, and sanitising some of this stuff. And we have to come up with credible, coherent policies that are solution-driven uh, to face this xenophobic, anti-migrant, you know, anti-worker uh, sentiment that, that, that is out there. So I just want to thank Sean uh, for his contribution today. Unfortunately, we can't. We've run out of time. Uh, this is a half-hour session. I'm sure Sean will be available after, out for a cup of coffee to have a chat. Uh, I want to thank Sean on your behalf for his contribution. Uh, and if we could give him a short uh, round of applause there, please.